Have you ever been explaining an aviation topic and started to realize you don't remember where you learned it? Did what you're saying come from an official source, or did it come out of hangar talk, or maybe from an offhand comment by an old CFI? Even worse, have you been called out for being wrong? I know I have. Aviation myths are all over the place. Let's identify and dispel with four big myths around IFR flying here. The last myth is the one I hear most often. Want accuracy and simplicity in your IFR training? Head over to the Flight Insight course page linked in the description to start our ground school today. Myth number one, there's a protected and non-protected side in a holding procedure. You'll hear this when looking, for example, at a parallel entry where an aircraft may be flying outbound on the other side of the racetrack pattern. And someone might say they're on the non-protected side of the hold and so can't do this. This concept of protected and non-protected sides isn't found in the FAA TERPs, the procedures for constructing instrument procedures like holds. If we look at a standard holding pattern, we can overlay the obstacle protection, which looks like this, and as you can see, it's complicated. The main takeaway is that there's protection on the holding side, in this case, the upper half of the zone, but also protection on the non-holding side, albeit a bit less of it. Holding patterns can grow and shrink depending on the different aircraft that fly them. Protection areas are also not one size fits all. The factors that go into how much obstacle protection a holding pattern offers are numerous, but the main ones are the aircraft's indicated airspeed, the altitude aircraft will be expected to hold at, and the distance between the holding fix and the nav aid used to identify it. This is what our protection area looks like flying this hold at 2,000 feet and 100 knots indicated, one of the smallest protected areas. And you can see that even here we have plenty of protection on the non-holding side. Don't push your luck, but certainly don't deviate from a traditional parallel entry in order to completely avoid the non-holding side. Myth number two, the glide slope intercept and final approach fix are always the same point. A glide slope intercept on a precision approach like an ILS is identified by a lightning bolt symbol on FAA plates, while the final approach fix is a Maltese cross often. You can see both presented here on the ILS or localizer approach into BWI. The FAF at Oriole is at 5.8 DME. Now the glide slope intercept, 2000 feet, is presented at being at the same point as the FAF, but it's not identified as being a set distance from anything, and there's a reason for that. Recall that altimeters are affected by temperature changes. When it's hotter than standard, say 35 degrees Celsius, as it can get in Maryland in the summer, the altimeter will read incorrectly low. When flying the ILS, we need to maintain 2000 on the altimeter until intercepting the glide slope, so we'll actually be flying a bit higher than a true 2000 foot altitude MSL. Consequently, our intercept takes place before Oriole, and as we start down on the glide slope, we pass over Oriole, the FAF for a non-precision approach, below 2000 feet. Myth number three, VOR radials align exactly with magnetic course. We all learn that radials from VORs are based on magnetic courses. So it's reasonable to assume that if we fly along a VOR radial, say the 360 radial from the Atomwa VOR, that we're actually following a due magnetic north course. Our direction on the chart here isn't straight up and down, it's skewed to the right a bit. This is normally due to magnetic variation, the difference between magnetic course and true course. But have a look at the variation here. It's zero degrees. There should be no difference between true and magnetic course here. A magnetic course of due north is a straight vertical line, but the 360 radial isn't straight up and down. The simple reason is that VOR radials aren't kept up to date frequently enough to match the ever-changing magnetic fields of the Earth. Finally, myth number four. The decision altitude is a hard floor and you can't go below it by even one foot. Many of us learn that on a non-precision approach, the minimum descent altitude, or MDA, is a hard floor. In the instrument ACS used on the checkride, the non-precision approach task tells us to maintain the MDA within 100 feet above, but gives us a zero foot tolerance below. You go below MDA by even a foot, and you fail. So it's natural to carry that logic to the DA for the precision approach. However, on the ACS for the precision approach, no mention is made of an altitude tolerance. We just have to maintain the needles and initiate a missed approach when reaching the DA. The reason is found in 91175C, which states that no aircraft can operate below the MDA without the visual references needed to do so, and no aircraft can continue the approach below the DA without them. Why the difference? Because we make our decision to go missed at the decision altitude. As we decide and then execute, transitioning from an approach descent to a missed approach climb, 
will gently drift below the DA as we change configuration, and that's okay and is part of the approach. Certainly don't continue the approach below the DA, but don't try to lead the mist approach by going mist early to try to prevent clipping underneath the DA. So those are some good IFR myths you'll hear around the hangar. If you have any good ones, let us know and we'll highlight them in a later video. As always, check out all our training courses at the link here or in the description today.